more talking about uh, where we are in hormone therapy for advanced prostate cancer and what does <coughs> hormone therapy really mean and how it's moving beyond the term uh, simple uh, castration, which is really what we've had to work with for the last 60, 60 years. And uh, I think there's a lot um, uh, rolling out uh, that is going to change significantly the landscape and the way we look on patients with advanced prostate cancer and how we uh, manage them. So um, I have a, some disclosures of conflict of interest just uh, with regards to some of the technologies that would likely to be discussed and consult with a variety of different uh, uh, companies. So this is just the overview of the approach, uh, overview for this uh, presentation. We'll start off with just an uh, overview of androgen action, uh, then uh, updating various aspects of androgen deprivation therapy, uh, a bit on where we are, concepts around MAB, and then timing issues, and recent uh, data on intermittent versus continuous therapy, and then end up with uh, a few concepts around castration resistance and how the AR as hormone therapy is still relevant in castrate resistant disease because um, it's really still cancer endocrinology all over again. And because the androgen receptor is so important in castrate resistant disease, we have to, uh, uh, as, a, as a group, uh, understand its, its role and its biology. What is it? It's an intracellular hormone receptor, um, a part of the um, uh, uh, steroid receptor superfamily, and has three basic domains. A, um, a, NH, uh, a N terminal transactivating domain, a DNA binding domain, and a ligand binding domain. Uh, and it's here that androgen binds and then leads to a conformational change that the receptor then translocates into the nucleus. This portion here uh, actually binds to various very specific um, androgen response elements in the uh, in various promoters to transactivate uh, different genes. So initially, uh, normally the AR is held in a confirmationally ready state in the cytoplasm by a number of scaffolding chaperone proteins. That's important, especially as we think about how biclutamide versus um, MDV work, um, especially in future mechanism type work. Uh, and its activity and specificity are modulated by a, a whole host of uh, interacting co-activators and signaling pathways. So I'm just going to uh, provide you with the three ways that androgen receptor mediates its biology. It, um, uh, the so-called classical pathway, ligand-dependent um, receptor activation, involves the binding of steroid hormone to its ligand-binding domain. It then uh, uh, dissociates from its heat shock protein complexes and translocates in the nucleus where it binds to uh, androgen response elements. So that's the canonical or classical pathway and it's how most of us think about how androgen receptor works. But there's also two other broad mechanisms. Ligand independent receptor activation involves um, uh, growth factors like EGF or um, uh, TGF alpha as examples, HER2 nu, uh, binding to their respective receptor tyrosine kinases, it activates a protein kinase cascade that then can uh, phosphorylate the androgen receptor, and that phosphorylation changes its conformation and its uh, sensitivity to low levels of ligand and allows the androgen receptor now go into the nucleus. So, uh, under it's, these, it's the cooperativity of these two pathways that ultimately drive androgen receptor transactivation um, during castrate resistance as well. So then there's non-nuclear uh, approaches where with ligand binding to the androgen receptor uh, within minutes at the level of the cytoplasm or cell membrane, uh, this uh, can lead to phosphorylation and, and activation of protein kinases that are independent of its genomic effects. So that's the so-called uh, non-genomic um, or non-nuclear effects of androgen receptors. And th collectively, these, uh, this leads to increased secretory activity in the prostate gland and cell survival and proliferative approaches. And I'll just go through this once again with just through this type of approach. And uh, Amina Zubedi uh, published on this in Cancer Research, just again illustrating how dynamic this process is where ligand comes in, binds the androgen receptor, 
which is normally held in its ligand-ready state here uh, by a whole host of different heat shock chaperones. And it leads to a very rapid phosphorylation event here within minutes. Five minutes later, HSP27 is phosphorylated. And this is an example of one of those non-nuclear effects of ligand binding to the AR. It doesn't involve DNA binding, but it leads to phosphorylation events through P38 kinase, rapid phosphorylation of HSP27, and then HSP27 displaces HSP90 as the dominant chaperone of the receptor. So here under ligand-deprived conditions, the AR sits in the cytoplasm, mainly co-localized with, with HSP90. But you treat five minutes later, and, uh, and within five minutes, it shifts over to phosphorylated HSP27. It then shuttles the AR into the nucleus, and you can see that here, uh, just the two, uh, both the AR and HSP27 translocating the nucleus within minutes after um, after androgen's treatment. So it illustrates just how dynamic and um, in flux this pathway is. And just when you thought it was getting uh, more, uh, uh, well, that you're starting to understand it, it's also important not to know all this, but to understand that this is a highly regulated complex, or, or um, highly regulated pathway that involves at least you know, a uh, hundred different coactivators that can modulate this in a cell type and context dependent manner. So again, it's highly, highly complex. Um, but in general, the androgen receptor is the dominant pro-survival signal in the in prostate cancer cells. It's not so much proliferative. It does enhance cell proliferation a little bit, but in general, it enhances cell survival through a variety of different pathways in including p interacting with a number of different signaling pathways, for example, IGF-1 signaling. Uh, it increases the level of cytoprotective chaperones like clostridium, BCL-2, HSP-27, all of which enhance cell survival. It's been shown to increase microRNA, which are naturally occurring antisense within the cell, and those then knock down pro-apoptotic genes things like BAC, for example, in this PNAS publication by Rafe DeVere White, Rafe DeVere White out of, out of San Diego. So those are examples of some of the biology that the androgen receptor mediates. It's clearly a pro-survival signal. It's an oncogene in terms of driving prostate cancer carcinogenesis and prostate cancer progression. And it really was the first um, uh, credentialized therapeutic target in prostate cancer and arguably the first molecular target in all of oncology, and this was work uh, that led to Charles Huggins' Nobel Prize back in the 1960s. And clearly, uh, there was uh, excellent responses, but these responses were not necessarily durable and invariably led to castrate resistance. And clearly, understanding these processes uh, can lead to a prolonged chronicity of the uh, uh, of uh, this um, delaying castrate resistance. So, how can we, sh short of understanding the microbiology, how can we use hormone therapy here, targeting the AR, to further prolong time to castrate resistance? And that's where uh, the space has been for the last 50 years, whether or not it's maximum androgen blockade, super targeting the androgen receptor, or applying hormone therapy early versus late, or intermittently versus continuously. So really, we're just modifying ADT in terms of dose and schedule to try to accomplish uh, a delay in progression. And for 30 years, uh, probably $100 million worth of clinical studies, complete androgen blockade hasn't really uh, uh, been borne out to be superior to simple castration, <laughs> followed by perhaps delayed blockade of the androgen receptor. Complete androgen blockade is just the use of an antiandrogen with medical or surgical castration. Um, and a number of studies, uh, including a meta-analysis here, uh, essentially show no significant gain when an antiandrogen was added to surgical or medical castration. The problem is that this medical, this um, meta-analysis included all types of castration therapy. It assumed that surgical and LHRH-induced castration was the same. It also assumed that ciprodone acetate, flutamide, and biclutamide were all the same. And we now know that that isn't necessarily the case. 
Indeed, CPA is probably inferior to those other antiandrogens, and biflutamide is superior to flutamide. And so a recent study out of Japan looked more, more uh, stringently at uh, the use of LHRH plus uh, biclutamide and compared CAB to monotherapy and actually showed that there was a prolongation in survival with the addition of biclutamide on top of, uh, of monotherapy castration. And so this plus additional data, uh, for example, here just in the lab with, uh, with Hide Kuruma's data, re-exploring the concept of early versus delayed biclutamide in addition to castration shows that if you treat with castration alone, you get this progression curve. Castration plus delayed, like second-line hormone therapy, biclutamide here. And then castration plus immediate biclutamide, you get this type of a delay. And this is uh, corresponding PSA curve. So the addition of biclutamide in animal models and in selected stringently controlled uh, phase 3 data would suggest that the blockage of, an, of the AR with a non like biglutamide actually does prolong survival. And uh, I'll come back to that later. It's certainly, I think, r uh, shifting back towards the use of MAB now um, and has changed my patterns of practice uh, in terms of recommending biglutamide with castration now as opposed to castration followed by delayed biglutamide. Uh, well, when I say castration, I, I mean uh, medical or surgical, yeah. So that's uh, uh, just a brief update on MAB, and uh, we can discuss that more in a QA. and a I don't want to spend too much time on it because it's really an old topic, but it is actually being revisited now with the concepts surrounding metivation and, uh, and abiraterone, and that's a, another reason why I think that uh, uh, at least while we have it, the use of biclutamide early is probably superior. So what about um, uh, the use of intermittent therapy versus continuous? And uh, we have to recognize that in the last 15 years, the target population receiving hormone therapy has changed significantly, principally because of the use of PSA and in earlier diagnosis, earlier detection of treatment failures. People are living longer on castration therapies. And we're having a tendency to move systemic therapies earlier into multimodal regimens or the treatment of uh, early detected recurrences across not just prostate cancer, but other solid cancers as well. And so is intermittent therapy a, uh, a viable option? Or even more bluntly, should it be considered the standard of care today, given what we know about uh, 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 the... Uh, uh, the studies that are now rolling out. So Doug, I'm just going to review this, and, and, uh, and I think intermittent therapy it can only be considered a feasible option if these criteria are met. And I'm going to walk through each of these individually and illustrate that each of these criteria are met and that intermittent therapy should be considered standard of care today. So let's start with cost containment. In our system, it's clear that cost containment is important. If you look at this, uh, the, this um, budget uh, slide here, this is uh, an example of uh, the cost spent on prostate cancer treatments. And just because of prevalence times time, hormone therapy is the single greatest burden on the provincial health care cancer budget in most provinces across Canada. These are global numbers, but you can just see that with combined an androgen deprivation and CAB, global 1.3 billion plus say another 2 billion for LHRH, that's $3 billion a year. That's a big market. And so uh, if we're going to be able to afford all these new targeted therapies that work up here in a much smaller population, we've got to be able to make some cost savings here. And uh, there is no bottomless pit, not even by the U.S. They can't afford to support global pharma anymore. And I think that in general, most systems are going to push towards cost containment. And intermittent therapy, I think, is one way as an illustration that we can actually save on, on health care as long as it's uh, on the health care cost as long as it doesn't uh, compromise uh, survival. So another prerequisite is that 
immediate or earlier therapy is better than deferred. If deferred therapy was the same as early, we could make all those cost savings, treat once the patient's symptomatic, and continuously until they die. But I think the question is whether or not immediate therapy or earlier therapy is better than late. And this is not a, a, an easy um, question to solve, but in general, the, uh, uh, the cumulative uh, 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 data would support triggering treatment earlier in those who are progressing and at risk of dying of their disease compared to deferring to the time of bone scan positive METs and symptoms. That's just too late. Clearly there's a gray spectrum of when to pull the trigger, but it should be, uh, uh, we shouldn't be waiting until uh, until advanced disease has become entrenched. So here's just a list, and I'm not going to get into each of these. Um, when Alan was a, a fellow way back when here, he actually looked at um, uh, Shinogi models and compared immediate versus deferred hormone therapy at various tumor volume burdens in this castrate dependent model and showed that improved survival was seen when castration was implemented at low tumor burden versus high tumor burden. All that does is show that, that mo like most systemic therapies, system uh, castration works better when tumor burden is small as opposed to waiting until heterogeneity and all sorts of other resistance mechanisms are built in and then the responses tend to be much more short-lived. So that's preclinical proof of principle. What about clinical studies? And again, I won't get into these. You're all aware of them. The ERTC study by BOLA showed that when it compared patients with high-risk localized non-metastatic cancer, hormone therapy plus radiation versus radiation therapy alone. And are those circumstances, uh, 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 the addition of hormone therapy Im significantly improved survival. It was actually the first study ever to show in prostate cancer a sur overall survival benefit with any therapeutic manipulation in a randomized phase three study. And that's why I think it's an important study, why it's a New England Journal publication. And it illustrated essentially that uh, uh, adding hormone therapy earlier as opposed to deferred uh, was, uh, had a survival advantage. The ECOG study with messing, similarly, uh, post-radiation therapy, or I'm sorry, post-radical prostatectomy, node-positive patients, only 100 patients, um, but it, it was strongly uh, um, supported and showed that overall survival and prostate cancer mortality uh, by the uh, inverse was significantly improved when castration was added at the early post-surgery as opposed to waiting until metastatic progression occurred and illustrating that early hormone therapy in that population prolonged survival. And then the last example I'll just go over illustrates the, how uh, we still have to have some clinical balance here because the early prostate cancer study, the EPC data, AstraZeneca, a global study, um, if you, uh, in m many countries, but if you just pull out the one study that was done in, in uh, Scandinavia, 1,000 patients, and they compared... Uh, it took a group of patients who had uh, localized prostate cancer. Some were low risk, some were high risk. Randomized to placebo versus Casidex. And what this data showed was that in patients with low risk prostate cancer, those who actually had a low risk of dying of their disease, if you treated them with Casidex, they actually had a worse overall survival compared to um, placebo. The opposite, though, is if you had high-risk localized prostate cancer and you retreat with early therapy versus deferred, then early therapy was better. And all this illustrates is that if you treat patients with hormone therapy or at low risk of dying their prostate cancer, you're going to hurt more people than you help. So it, 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 the very therapy that we're applying to people to try and prolong survival, if it's applied inappropriately, you're going to have adverse effects above and beyond the quality of life uh, impacts that we know hormone therapy has. So this just it, it, it emphasizes the importance of if you're going to use earlier hormone therapy, apply it in people who are progressing and are more likely to be at risk of dying of their disease as opposed to um, uh, treating all comers in a non-selected 
risk stratified manner. So I think that data again illustrates that that um, uh, uh, that immediate therapy is better than deferred. I think we can all agree that continuous hormone therapy has side effects, and while um, and these short, uh, side effects are both short term, hot flushes, loss of libido, uh, and there's also long term metabolic effects, uh, in, including loss of muscle mass, anemia, osteoporosis, metabolic syndrome, cognition, all of which we may be able to reduce the burden of by applying intermediate or uh, intermittent therapy as opposed to continuous therapy. And so this is where intermittent, uh, intermittent therapy offers the opportunity to improve quality of life by balancing the be benefits of immediate therapy, which are all listed here, while reducing treatment-related effects and expense. And there's a, been a whole field of research over the last 15 years, a lot of it led by people like Matt Smith and others, just showing that ADT has adverse effects that are quantifiable. You get changes in muscle mass, an increase in fat mass. Uh, we can see it. Uh, we sort of knew it. We never quantified it. It's quantifiable. You can quantify the effects of ADT on insulin sensitivity. And this is in part due to, and is a reflection of Mike Cox's work in, in, uh, in our lab, again, showing that there's an interaction between androgen signaling and insulin signaling, where they're cooperative. And if you knock out the AR, you decrease insulin responsiveness, and that can lead to the metabolic syndrome. And so uh, the question is, are these all reversible? Uh, but in general, there is a, uh, a number of studies showing that, that uh, intermittent therapy does lead to either an attenuation of or a reversal of the side effects associated with intermittent therapy. So I think that continuous therapy has side effects, and that's another checkbox. So what about adaptive uh, mechanisms? If, if clonal selection was the only thing that drove progression to castrate resistance, then intermittent therapy wouldn't make sense. And this is just illustrated here uh, schematically where it, it was initially uh, speculated or hypothesized that clonal expansion of pre-existing castrate-resistant clones actually were responsible for castrate resistance through clonal expansion of pre-existing genetically determined subpopulations. But it's now clear that adaptive responses are an important and perhaps more important driver than clonal selection itself, and that if you treat with castration, you actually create a stress response or a change in the environment that actually changes the gene expression profile of the regressing tumors. That if you give back androgens, you can redrive these cells back down a pathway that allows them to be androgen dependent or pre-apoptotic again. And this is old data coming out of uh, 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 the group here with Nick Burkowski, Paul Rennie, um, showing that androgen uh, resistance, at least in part, results from adaptive cell survival mechanisms that are activated by androgen withdrawal. Uh, that in a parent androgen-dependent tumor with castration, you eliminate a lot of the androgen-dependent tumor cells, and at the end, you're left with a small population of androgen-independent clones. If you just continue to grow that tumor in castrate conditions, these would continue to progress in a castrate-resistant manner and manifest itself as a castrate-resistant tumor. But if you give back androgens, you then drive their population to proliferate and create daughter cells that are, again, androgen-dependent. So that's the, the, uh, the, the hypothesis. It's supported by preclinical model system, again, in this this model, Shinogi model, where with castration alone, you get this type of response. But if you treat with intermittent therapy, you can prolong androgen dependence of these xenografts about threefold. And this is similarly seen in another model system, uh, again out of our lab, where cast using a human model, where with castration, and this is using serum PSA, with castration you get decreases and then increases again. And this is shown here where at the gene expression level, w after castration, the gene expression of PSA, which is androgen receptor driven, decreases, but it again in, uh, increases during castrate resistance um, driven by the androgen receptor. With intermittent therapy, you can modulate this process and prolong 
androgen receptor dependence over this gene by about three times longer. So again, it's just another bit of data supporting the fact that you can modulate the adaptive pathways that drive castor resistance by intermittently re-exposing that tumor to androgens to allow it to maintain androgen dependence for a lot longer. So that's the basic um, biology behind uh, intermittent therapy. The last uh, endpoint is, or second to last, is definable on and off trigger points. While intermittent therapy was being evaluated in this in the, as early as the 70s, people like Lori Klotz, John Trackenberg, when they were actually doing their fellowship at Memorial, started it with uh, DES, but that was pre-PSA, so there weren't any good trigger points. It wasn't until Nick Burkowski and, and Larry Goldenberg here started a prospective phase two study that showed that if you used PSA as a trigger point, you could actually uh, um, uh, treat patients with castration, follow their PSA, come off after nine months, allow the testosterone to recover, here libido would return, other quality of life measures would improve, and over time PSA would again rise. You could then re-implement another cycle of castration therapy and drive it back down into uh, remission again and continue with this cycle on and off. And in general, about 20% of patients would progress on each cycle. But there were many patients who were being treated five, six, or seven cycles, again allowing improved periods of quality of life off therapy. And so this was phase two proof of concept data, and it was supported in parallel with a number of other centers, Tia Gano out of Seattle, small samples, Gary Grossio out of San Francisco, we need a crook in Ottawa, Nick Burkowski led a multi-center phase two across Canada. All these are phase two data that supported the feasibility of intermittent therapy. They did not appear to be hurting patients. And so I think that what they illustrated was that there were definable on and off trigger points that allowed intermittent therapy to be applied in a feasible way to patients with, with advanced prostate cancer. So that's great. I think that uh, uh, you know these are phase two data. We could have stopped there because clearly phase two data always looks great, but we know that phase two data is oftentimes not as good as what we would like them to be, and it takes phase three data to ultimately uh, uh, pave the way to level one evidence. So while this phase two data was, um, uh, was showing feasibility, a number of large groups were testing this in prospective phase three studies. Several small European studies, a German study, a Portuguese study, um, were not powered to equivalence, but actually did not show any inferiority of, of um, uh, intermittent therapy versus continuous. I don't get into those too much just because they, were, they weren't they uh, were all that powered. But in North America, um, NCICCTG and SWOG partnered on two large phase three studies, one in M1 or D2 disease, comparing continuous versus intermittent therapy, target enrollment, 1,300 patients, over 2,000 patients were registered, 1,300 randomized. This has been closed now for about three or four years. It will be reported at ASCO this year. And uh, this, the rumor mill is that it's going to have similar readouts to this study, which I'll show you data on now. So this will be re reported at ASCO this year. This study was reported last year at ASCO. It's not yet published. This is uh, the companion study to PR8. Uh, PR7 compared continuous versus intermittent in patients with radiation recurrent PSA progressive but non-metastatic prostate cancers. Over 1,300 patients were randomized. And what it showed was that after a median follow-up of 6.5 years, intermittent therapy was non-inferior uh, with re respects to overall survival. There were a couple of surprises. One was that actually time to progression in some ways favored intermittent therapy, that is time to hormone resistance, but there was some built-in bias in terms of how the protocol was designed that may account for some of that. But at least you can say that there was no obvious accelerated time to progression. 
27% of the time was spent on therapy. We were expecting about half the time to be spent on therapy. That's a, a, that's a huge cost savings. If you can treat patients with hormone therapy, spend 75% of the time off therapy and not compromise overall survival, and at the same time improve quality of life, this is a no-brainer. So uh, the data was strongly um, positive in terms of its non-inferiority. Um, in addition, uh, what was interesting, although not statistically significant anyways, 9% of more, more prostate cancer deaths in the in intermittent arm, 8% more non-prostate cancer deaths in the continuous arm. Again, that may support some of our preconceived conceptions that, that maybe there's a, you lose a little bit of anti-cancer efficacy with intermittent therapy, but the trade-off there is less non-prostate cancer deaths. So that's one take-home message from that. So I think that in general, we can say that intermittent therapy should now be considered standard uh, of care and um, based upon that data and the likelihood that PR8 is also going to show similar results to PR7. So just to end this, this um, section on really comparing uh, uh, ADT to, or overview of ADT, I think that today uh, randomized studies and meta-analysis suggest a small survival benefit of MAB with biclutamide. My own approach is when I'm using castration in patients who are at high risk of or having very high risk disease, I'll add Casidex to biclutamide. Um, and, and intermittent therapy is non-inferior to continuous and should be considered standard of care in patients with PSA recurrent and, and positive disease. So in the last 10 to 15 minutes, I'll just move on and talk about castrate resistance and what are some of the things on the horizon that are gaining a foothold in the castrate resistance space, but is going to invariably move upstream into the hormone sensitive space where we tend to spend a lot of our time managing patients. And that's why this is of relevance to us as a, as a clinical group. And as I mentioned before, the AR is clearly the main driver of progression. And if we can understand the other mechanisms, we can prolong chronicity of this disease. And, uh, and in the past, up until recently, the AR was relatively ignored in this progression process because we assumed that it was controlled with castration. But it's clear now that the AR is reactivated through either mechanisms involving its overexpression, the acquisition of mutations that are in part driven by the selective pressures of treatment, just like bacteria and antibiotics. If you knock out the ligand, the AR under Darwinian pressures are going to select mutations that try to bypass that. And those are point mutations and even splice variants. And in addition, you've got intratumoral steroidogenesis, uh, which I'll come back to shortly. In addition, though, there are other mechanisms that actually cooperate with the AR. So the AR can't be thought of as a singular linear pathway. There are other pathways, including growth factor uh, pathways, that cooperate with to enhance AR signaling. And the AR actually cooperates with these growth factor signaling to enhance both cell survival and proliferations. And these include and are often mediated by cytoprotective chaperones that help communication between uh, pathways and cellular networks. So it's, a, it's not, you can't think of this in a linear process. So let's just focus on new therapies for the AR. The AR is known to be overexpressed and still nuclear in castrate resistant disease, which means as a transcription factor, it's likely active. And that's uh, certainly um, shown by rising PSA as the sort of sentinel uh, AR regulated gene. And there are three ways emerging to target the AR in castrate resistant disease. You can either uh, further suppress the ligand uh, by blocking intratumoral steroidogenesis. You can develop better casidex like molecules, and these are happening. Or you can destabilize the AR by targeting the chaperones that stabilize it. And our groups here have been involved at each of these different levels, with Colleen Nelson and her grad student Jen Locke being the first to confirm that the prostate cancer cells can produce uh, DHT uh, independent of adrenal precursors. 
and they did this by carbon labeling or C14 uh, labeled acetate which then uh, through cholesterol and all these enzymes that are upregulated in cashew resistant cells can go through what's called the backdoor pathway to produce DHT and so uh, the prostate cancer cells in addition to adrenal and Leydig cells have now been confirmed to be able to make DHT uh, independent of other pre steroidal precursors. And that is just, uh, again, emphasizes that this has to be an area that is focused on as, as, um, uh, as a therapeutic target. And alongside of this, abiraterone acetate was developed. It's actually a more potent CYP17 inhibitor than ketoconazole. It was uh, 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 developed at Cancer UK out licensed to a small biotech company called Cougar, which was actually co-founded by a urologist, Ari Beldergren, uh, then went on to uh, be acquired after phase two by, uh, by J&J. But this agent is, uh, inhibits um, androgen biosynthesis, not just in the testicle and adrenal gland, but also in the prostate cancer cells itself. And that data has now been out. It's published in New England Journal now a robust four-month gain in overall survival, almost twice that of docetaxel, and yet this is a pill that can be given once a day that is very well tolerated. Uh, you only have to watch out for some fluid retention and hypokalemia. And so this is something that is moving forward as we speak upstream of castrate resistance and what, uh, something that we have to be aware of. Um, Antiandrogens blocking the ligand binding domain and that's uh, where Medivation 3100 is. It is compared to uh, untreated controls, Casidex versus here a, a precursor of Medivation, much more active preclinically. Again, it blocks ligand binding here much more potently than biclutamide. And in fact, when it binds to the androgen receptor, the androgen receptor does not dislocate from its chaperone complex. With biclutamide binding and flutamide binding, these can still go into the nucleus. But with uh, MDV, it entraps the AR in the nucleus, and the AR then actually becomes more chaperone dependent because it's actually stabilized in the cytoplasm. Again, it's, it's active, uh, and um, in phase two studies, uh, uh, out of a number of different centers here at a memorial, in patients, it, there's clear activity. This is a, what's called a PSA waterfall plot of patients with castrate-resistant prostate cancer. And the vast majority of patients treated with metivation actually have a robust PSA response, more than 50% having a more than 50% decline in PSA. So this is a robust signal of activity. It went into phase three post-taxotere. And about two weeks ago, um, uh, this study was re uh, was released by a press release from Medivation and Estellus, its global partner. Uh, again, a, a four over a four month gain in overall survival, hazard ratio, 37% reduction in death rate. This is actually, if anything, slightly better than Abby, but you can't really compare the two. Suffice to say that it's in the same ballpark as Abby, and it's another drug that moves the yardstick closer to the touchdown zone in terms of uh, being a, a very active drug, safe, well-tolerated, and prolonging overall survival. So um, that's uh, 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 the example of the antiandrogens coming. There's actually several more coming in behind it as well. So another way, a third concept, is lowering the androgen receptor itself by targeting the chaperones that stabilize it in the cytoplasm. Uh, and this comes back to work that uh, Amina Zubedi did in the lab, showing again that the AR is require chaperones both for um, basal uh, receptivity and, and activation, but also uh, for transactivation into the uh, translocation into the nucleus. There are small molecule inhibitors of HSP90 in development. They're having problems moving forward for various reasons. We went ahead and targeted HSP27 with the concept that, with the hypothesis that if we inhibited HSP27, we would destabilize the AR, and it would then become ubiquinated and degraded by the proteasome. 
and Amina, Amina showed this in her cancer research paper that that was actually the case. And we can illustrate it in this um, um, figure that this is a, a androgen sensitive prostate cancer cell tumor right here. It's light signal. Luciferase is driven by androgen receptor promoters and activated by testicle by testosterone. So if you castrate the animal, the light signal disappears. So this is just a, a uh, illustration that castration shuts off AR signaling. We know that, but now you can model it. And over a period of weeks after castration, the AR signal again becomes reactivated. Not because the tumor is getting bigger, the tumor is still there. It's becoming reactivated because these mice, in these mice, the human prostate cancer tumor is turning on all the enzymes that make intratumoral DHT, and that then drives AR signaling again. But if you come in and knock out HSP27 here, you can destabilize the AR and decrease AR transactivation, and this leads to a delay in progression in terms of both tumor volume and PSA progression. Preclinical proof of principle that targeting HSP27 uh, delays castrate resistant progression and this then went into a phase one study here in Vancouver at two other centers across uh, Canada uh, led by Kim Chi this drug has been licensed to Oncogenics and Oncogenics is a commercial vehicle but in this phase um, one study which treated prostate ovary lung bladder and others we had three patients out of 15 that actually had a robust uh, uh, PSA decline. In addition, many of the patients had a dose-dependent increase or a dose-dependent decrease in CTC count. CTCs are circulating tumor cells. They're a, uh, an easily obtained peripheral blood sample that allows you to measure anti-cancer effects by measuring cir uh, the circulating tumor cell burden. And this has been shown in some studies to be predictive of improved survival. So we use it in early studies to identify anti-cancer effects. And in this study, we were able, we able to see both PSA declines as well as decreases in CTC. That prompted uh, two studies now, uh, actually three that are open. One is a randomized phase two study in CRPC, in uh, uh, OGX427 um, plus prednisone versus prednisone alone. That study will be presented at GUASCO this year, and we're seeing excellent uh, signals of anti-cancer activity in that study. In addition, uh, Allen has a study of, super in, of superficial bladder, and we've just opened a global study of OGX427 um, with uh, uh, or without GEM and CIS in metastatic bladder cancer, and that study is now open. So that's a, an example of, of 427. I'll end with one uh, just three minutes on clustering as an illustration of what's called co-targeting. And this is the future of biologic therapies. You can't go in with one agent at a time. You have to combine them. Clustering is a stress-induced cytoprotective chaperone, which we've shown to be associated with castrate resistance. Its it targeted inhibitor is in phase three studies in combination with chemotherapy. But more recently, we wanted to look at it in combination with metivation, since it's actually a castration-induced gene, initially called testosterone-repressed prostate message 2, or TERPM2. But we were able to show that it sensitizes metivation in vitro, and in combination with uh, metivation, cluster and knockdown actually induces cell death. Either alone does not induce a lot of cell death, but the two of them together do. And that when used together in castrate resistant models, we actually have significant synergy. So this is exciting because now metivation is going to get used. We're starting to look at combination studies of metivation plus OGX011. But it's an illustration of how you can work out biologic um, mechanisms that help rationalize what are called co-targeting studies. And um, you have, when we come in and try and kill a cell with metivation, the cancer cell is turning on all sorts of cell survival mechanisms to bypass that treatment stress. And we've been able to just work out recently how clue silencing actually <coughs> helps to decrease metivation induction of a 
cell survival pathway called autophagy. It silences metabation induction of a signaling pathway called AKT that induces cell survival. And I'll just illustrate that, that, that in this, uh, while it's a lot of data, it's very relevant because in a recent publication by Brent Carver, who's a urologist out of uh, Memorial, working with Charles Sawyers, he was able to show that when you try and block the AR, AKT is induced, and that's a driving resistance pathway. If you block the AKT pathway, the AR is induced. So going forward, we have to we recognize now just how dynamic these crosstalk pathways are. So you have to knock out both of them. And here you can see that with metivation treatment, clusterin is induced and phospho-AKT is induced. So these are both stress-induced survival pathways. If you go ahead and block clusterin with clusterin knockdown, you can then block metivation induced induction of AKT signaling. So that's an example of how you can, by coming in with an AR antagonist here, plus a clusterin inhibitor, collectively block the crosstalk that is an important driver of cassidy resistance. So that's, um, uh, I think, uh, just a walkthrough of where I think androgen receptor signaling and targeting is going. It isn't just a single linear, singular linear pathway. We have to be aware of the crosstalk networks that are in play, and that will help guide better, more rational strategies. This pathway remains the most important pro-survival signaling pathway in prostate cancer. Um, <coughs> MAB is the initial attempts at it were uh, infant steps. I think that now with more potent anti androgen like motivation, we're going to be able to make big gains as these are moved forward in MAB type approaches. Intermittent therapy is now non inferior and can be considered the standard of care for most patients with, ca uh, with, with uh, castrate sensitive disease. And castration resistance will remain the main hurdle going forward. And this is where an understanding of crosstalk pathways and treatment and heat shock responses are playing a role in guiding combination studies. And again, a lot of our research was focused initially on understanding initial castration and castrate resistance. The future now is here, and not just in focusing here, but understanding how super AR ablation with metivation or abiraterone is going to change the phenotype and there are going to be all sorts of new signaling pathways that are emerging that we have to focus on and as Gretzky says you have to skate to where the puck is going to be not where it is and that the future of, of targeted therapies in prostate is in this area and um, I just want to end by again emphasizing that you know our our past as urologic oncologists and urologic surgeons was as uh, uh, initially applied anatomists and and pathophysiologists the future is going to be in uh, in apply, being applied molecular biologists this is where huge investments are going it's where the disease is going to be uh, controlled and um, and and managed in the future and this isn't even in the future it's actually now and if we miss our ability to be part of this trip, we will be sidelined and ultimately evolve into something that is less relevant. And, um, and uh, we can take ex examples of some of our other surgical colleagues on how they've missed the boat in their, in their subspecialty and how we as a subspecialty have to actually continue to move forward. So I'll just end by... Uh, thanking and acknowledging the many people who contributed to this talk. Uh, uh, especially want to acknowledge Nick Burkowski, who is really, I think, the founder uh, of intermittent therapy as far as uh, conceptualizing and driving it forward. Larry and Paul Rennie um, uh, were important drivers early in this process as well. Recognize the work of Amina Zubedi here and her work with HSP27, a lot of the other molecular biology studies and the many postdocs and fellows that contribute to the work uh, as well. So I'll end there. Thank you for your attention and welcome any questions.